Well, here we are for another Ask the Doggy Expert Live. How is everybody doing this evening? Uh, my name is Andrew Frazier. I'm so happy to be here. I'm the founder of Doggy Zone, and I am joined by two other amazing people today. We have our co-host, Jessica, who many of you have seen before. And we also have a very special guest, Brian from Invisible Fence, who's also a really special guest. And we'll talk a little bit more about why he's a special guest here very shortly. And uh, looks like George is uh, is in the comments already. So uh, George is here in spirit, uh, but he is busy working away. So uh, maybe we'll get a couple of uh, comments from him as we go. But first off, um, great to see you guys. How are you all doing? Oh, I'm, I'm doing great, Andrew. <laughs> good, good. Brian, how about yourself? Well, thank you. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> well, I figured we would... Um, we would just kind of uh, talk a little bit about, first off, Invisible Fence and, and how it is that uh, Brian and I know each other. So Brian tells the story way, way better than I do. Um, but I like to I like to say, like, first off, without Brian, I probably uh, wouldn't be doing what I am doing today. Brian was a big inspiration to me earlier on in my career. And um so, Brian, maybe you could tell the story a little bit about the first time that you met me. What did that look like? It, it's funny. I was thinking about that earlier today, and it, it's probably 20 years ago, pretty close to the day that I met you. And it was a sleety, snowy, you know, kind of a couple inches of snow on the ground kind of day. And I was early for the, my, my appointment with you. And I'm sitting up the street from your parents' house, and there's this little skinny kid standing outside with his with his dog, and and they're sleep beating off my car. And I'm like, this can't be my sales call. It's just you know, little kid with all this big bushy hair, and and you had your head, your hood up over your head. Your your dog looked like he was about to take you for a walk. And I, so I pull up, and I'm like, hey, what's your deal? And you go, my you know my dad said i couldn't have a dog anything that happens with this dog um i have to pay for and i need a fence i'm like okay how are you gonna pay for it and andrew says i don't know and after a while we were talking with each other and talking about different stuff and you know andrew's 13 years old at the time and i kind of go all right man here's the deal we're gonna come put the fence in your dad's gonna pay me for the fence and and on Saturday mornings, he's going to drop you off at my office at 930 and he's going to come pick you up at 230 and you're going to pay him back with all the money that you made. This eyes did that this big around going, oh, my God, he, he just gave me he just gave me a job. And so um, as time went on and Andrew went through high school, he would take uh, my office used to be on on Falls Road in Potomac. And so he would take the bus down from Richard Montgomery and hop off in front of the office and for four years, he ran service in my office. And so he learned customer service. He learned how the fence worked. He learned how to train a dog. And um, when it came time to go to college, Andrew goes, hey, I'm not cut out to go to, to college. I think I want to go to dog training school. And you know, he was lucky to have good parents around him. And um, by then, I was working with, or I'd been working with George and um, Al Marks since the late 90s. And so I just kind of had Andrew follow them around. and now he's their boss so it's kind of, <laughs> kind of, kind of neat to see how how Andrew's you know gone from the low man on the totem pole to the to the big guy and it's it's really kind of impressive to see how he's grown and really um developed doggy zone into such a uh, a great facility well first off thank you um because uh, as i mentioned earlier i wouldn't be where i am today uh having not had that experience with you um nor would i have i met george and al um who've also been uh great mentors over the years and uh as you know everybody knows george has uh been, been working with us uh very closely for a while now so um super super glad to have you on here and there's um you know, so much that we could we could talk about. But, you know, I want to make tonight about, um, you know, really kind of getting into some things that people may not know. And so um, we'll definitely take some time to, to talk a little bit more. Um, but real quick, let's just kind of run through our, our plan for this evening. Um, of course, those of you that have questions, like make sure that you guys throw those things into the chat bar. Like, tonight's going to be a really great night because I know that almost Every single one of you that are going to be on here watching are going to have a question. 
And I, I want you to not just keep the question in your head, but I actually want you to put it out there because there's no stupid questions. And a lot of the times people think, oh, I don't want to ask that because I'll be embarrassed. Well, there's none of that here. Uh, we would love to answer questions for you. And our goal is to help provide you guys an educational and um, we'll just see what we can do on the entertaining side of things for you here as well. Um, but that being said, uh, we are going to talk about uh, a couple fun topics here. Uh, definitely we'll be going through how it is to train your dog to respond to you off leash under distraction, which mm. I think is a concept that most people don't even think about. But we're going to talk to you about why it's so, so freaking important for you to pay attention to. Like having that dog trained to off leash reliability is super, super important. Um, we're also going to talk about some of our favorite tools for training dogs um, and keeping pets safe at home, as well as some of the myths around the different training tools that are mm -hmm. out there um, and some of the different tools that, um, you know, Brian and, and ourselves use. Um, and lastly, we're going to finish by going through um, when to use treats versus toys to train your dog. What's the difference between the two? How do those actually affect your dog's training? Uh, we got a cool product of the month feature we want to let you guys know about here this evening. So uh, stay tuned for that. That'll be at the very end of things. Um, but without further ado, let's let's dive right into things. And um, Jessica, maybe um, I'll have you start off. You know, you work day to day with a lot of clients. Yeah. Um, can you tell me, in your opinion, like why do you think it's important for dogs to be trained to respond off leash? Oh, geez, Andrew, I could name probably 5,000 different reasons and situations where um, you might want a dog trained off leash. Um, but I feel like the, the most important time that you want the dog to be able to respond off leash is in more of like an emergent situation. Um, leash breaks, dog jumps out of the car, you know, runs out of the fence, all of these different kind of emergent situations that we don't always plan for. Um, you know, I always equate that with, you know, teaching my son when there's an emergency to call 911 and how to think fast under high levels of pressure. Yeah, I, I would I would tend to agree with you. It's it's more about safety for me would be like the number one thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Leashes break, collars come off, doors get left open. Gates, uh, yeah. As they say, stuff happens. Right. <laughs> So safety is probably the number one thing for me. The, the, the other thing that comes to mind for me is freedom. Yeah. Right. Safety and then freedom. Right. Like we all have dogs to enjoy them. Now I want, I don't even know that people will be honest. So I'm not going to ask you to do this. I was going to say, um, how many of you really trust your dogs off leash? Yeah, I'd be willing to bet you that a lot of you watching this probably are not as comfortable. Yeah, Brian's like, mm, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I mean, most people, the idea of having your dog off leash is scary. Yeah. And, and it's downright something that you would almost never consider doing. But I'm telling you that I think that you're missing out on a really, really great part of owning a dog. And to me, one of my favorite parts of owning a dog is being able to watch my dog be a dog. And when my dog is on a leash, cooped up, and he cannot run full speed and chase the ball and jump over logs and, you know, dive under stuff and dig and just be a goofball, I don't feel like I'm a great dog owner. So for me, I really, really like to have freedom for, uh, for my dogs. And I think that's uh, really the hallmark of what Invisible Fence does for people at home. Brian, what are your thoughts? So it, it, it's interesting, like the, the way we do the training is we use a 20 foot long lead. Mm. And so this way, the way we used to do it was just on regular six foot lead. We'd walk the dog up to the flags and pull them back and, and praise them. And about six months ago with, with COVID starting, I started using longer leads so that we, we had some social distancing. And what we noticed was by using a, a real low correction level, um, instead of using the leash correction, when the dogs got next to the, the flags, they'd, they'd feel a little tickle, then you'd give them a treat. Mm. And, and this way you could let them be a dog. So this way, if they wanted to go sniff around over there, you would let the fence do the work instead of the trainer really doing a lot of the work. You'd, you'd let them make their own mistake and then you'd call them back to praise them. And then as we were doing the training, 
we kind of have people go in and out of the of the fence and in and out of the flags and you see the dogs come when they're called so you can actually practice come when you're called in the yard which is a for an emergency situation but you get a really strong come in the you know when come when they're called but you also get them learning the fence too without a whole lot of without a whole lot of correction so by by changing it up how we how we've been doing it for the last 25 years and doing real low corrections with the long lead we're starting to see a lot of a lot of change and it's completely positive reinforcement because me who used to be the bad guy at the end of the six foot leash now i'm 20 feet away with the treat in my hand and when they when i say come they run back to me and you know they they come up they sit down and you give them a treat and they go yay and you know it's just just real low consistent um repetition with them and after a while you just start seeing them go yeah i don't really want to go by those flags and then mom run, runs down the flags and comes back in and the dog goes bolting over to her she prays them real quick leaves goes down the line comes back in and you see that come just super strong all the way around the yard and you know the the, the example i always use is if somebody's at a soccer game or something and a leash goes away you want to be able to crouch down and put your arms out real big and say you know say milo come and have him bolt 100 miles an hour to you because your body language and the same the same um, method that you use it every single time should just be should be used every single time and and that way if you're in an emergency situation you crouch down and give them a big target and then next thing you know your dog's jumping in your arms and um but but watch them be able to be a dog and sniff and poke around and go okay here you're gonna go find it yourself and that way they go find it themselves and then they turn around and get praised it's it's really soft and easy and positive reinforcement the whole way around yeah i um so i got my first my first fence in wow 20 years uh, yeah it, it was was it 2000 2001 yeah that sounds about right so i i just got my my second third i don't know third or fourth invisible fence uh from <laughs> bouncing around over the, the last 10 years of my life but anyways they just put in my new fence and all of my dogs have eight, uh, dogs. Gotten... <laughs> eight, dogs, that? eight dogs that we've trained on the fence for you mm. yeah Tanner, the three Malinois and the four you have now. Yep. So uh, quite a few of my dogs, if not almost all of them. It's crazy. It's a lot of dogs. <laughs> What's wrong with me? <laughs> but my dogs, my dogs love it because, you know, they can just be outside and I can give them that time to, to be able to just poke around and, and have some freedom. And, um, you know, now that I have a, a, a young baby at home, I'm not worried about him leaving gates open yet, but, um, you know, that's not going to be too far away. And so I know that it'll uh, definitely give me give me peace of mind there. So, you know, I think for um, what I think about here is when we have dogs that we want to train them to respond awfully, there's really a, um, a long process that we have to go through. Um, training a dog to off-leash reliability takes, um, first off, training your dog to be extremely consistent on-leash, um, right. then off-leash under low distraction situations before we can move to off-leash around high distraction situations. And a lot of people don't think about what that really means. But do you want your dog to come to you when there's somebody knocking at the front door? Well, I'm, I'm sure that you would. You want them to respond off-leash in that scenario around distraction, right? You probably would want them to do the same thing in the yard if they saw right. the neighbor next door and they were distracted and maybe they were barking at the neighbor next door. You'd want to be able to call them to you off-leash under distraction. And a lot of people don't think about that. Um, training a dog to that level requires a significant amount of consistency. And where most of our clients fall flat is on that icy hill of dog training that we've talked about in the past, where they start training the dog and they get about halfway there and then life gets busy and they put it on the back burner and they say, I'll get back to this later. And then they end up having to start over. Again. And it's this reciprocal cycle over and over and over where, you know, the dog's getting training, but he's never really gotten trained. Right. And so the goal is to get the dog trained, not just go through training. And that's the exercise that we see a lot of people do. So I think the big benefit um, that you really get from the fence there here is attendance isn't mandatory. Correct. Right. So we can train a dog off leash. That's great. And we're happy to do that. But I need to be there to say, come to my dog. I need to be there to give those commands. And without me there, we're kind of back at square one. 
So that fence really is something that allows us to know that even if I'm not there, when the door gets left open, or whatever the case may be, that my dog's still being protected. So that's that's kind of where my head goes. Jessica, in your opinion, I'm curious what you say here. Okay. How long do you think it would take to train a dog to respond to you off leash around distraction? And we'll just say at home, right? Because we okay. didn't even discuss taking the dog anywhere, going Very to crazy. a dog park or a fair or something like that. Field trips and things like that. Yeah. How long do you think it would take? Well, and I, I'll just talk about my personal experience. Um, you don't want to rush this process. And I think a lot of times we find students in, in training want to bridge that gap really quickly between the on leash transition to off leash. And there's no shortcutting that at all. Um, you don't want to, you don't want what we call, um, Bill Keeler would call them um, goofing gaps in your training. Um, so when you go through that process, you know, consider um, as you're doing your work, maybe eight months to 10, 12 months, depending on how consistent that you're being um, in that process, depending on what training tools you're using, how you're tapering those, those tools off, whether you're working on the long line and just doing traditional training, if you're using the electronic collar. So I think there's a couple of things that you go through that process, but I'll say um, with my youngest dog, Buck, who will be four this year, um, it was probably about eight months, nine months in of serious training that I felt comfortable being able to walk him throughout my property with, you know, mild, mild to high distractions. Yeah, I think with a traditional training approach, um, yeah, I mean, you're looking at anywhere from six months to a year. And, you know, that's given that you have the time to put into it. Um, I think with remote collar training, we can definitely have dogs responding off leash um, around distraction much sooner. Um, but um, it's still uh, quite time consuming. We had a question come in here from uh, Mary Ann, and she said, my dog has been trained to come at the hear command. Mm. He's also trained to respond to the come command. Is this too confusing for him? Um, Mary Ann, I'll tell you what I, I do with my dogs is I actually have two different commands that mean come to me. One of them is come. When my urgent situation comes up, I use the come command. If I need them right here, right now, no negotiation, I use the word come. The other word that I use is let's go. It's no different than here maybe to you. Let's go is just mean I'm getting moving, finish what you're doing and get with me. Okay. So it's not like the house is on fire and we need to get you out of the house. It's like I'm walking just get with me, just kind of move along with me. It doesn't mean come and stop and sit directly at my feet. It just means kind of move and follow me. And I use that because there's times where when I say come, I need my dog at, right at my feet. And there's times when I don't want them there. I just want them to kind of move in my direction. And that's where I tend to use um, use the let's go command. So something for you to, uh, to consider there. Um, but those are definitely, um, it's normal, in my opinion, as long as you're being clear to use two different commands for that. So um, one of the things that going back to the off leash piece is that puppy owners mm -hmm. love to have their dogs off leash. Now, I have a two month old at home right now. A lot of you know this already. Um, it's interesting. Okay, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> I'm totally learning a lot right now. And dog training has a lot of similarities between training kids and, and vice versa, believe it or not. My sister uh, is a, a teacher and, and she, um, she laughs at me because she says, I know that you're going to turn this conversation into a dog training conversation every time we're talking about kids. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, Anyways, a lot of the times what we end up doing with um, with puppies is just giving them an immense amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. We say, hey, 
you're adorable and you let's let you do whatever you want. We'll try to keep an eye on you. And then the house gets destroyed. <laughs> the house gets destroyed. So one of my favorite ones of the house being destroyed is when I was sitting on somebody's couch and their two border collies that were nine months old were sitting there pulling the uh, fabric off of the couch while I was sitting on it, having a conversation with the owners while they walked. Oh. That was really no boundaries at all whatsoever set. And here's the thing. If you can't create boundaries for that super young, cute, adorable puppy, you're, you're in trouble because it doesn't get easier as they get older. Mm -mm. It only gets more difficult. So setting those boundaries really, really young is important. And the big mistake that I see a lot of puppy owners make is we have this new puppy. Let's have him out. Let's give him freedom. And the intention is there for it to be a good thing. The reality is, is that dogs are always learning by design or by default, and it's up to you to decide what it's going to be. We end up letting them train by default, which means they chew things up. They go to the bathroom in the house. Um, they create habits like getting on furniture, counter surfing, trash diving, you know, you name it. There's a million different things that they end up getting into because the reality is, is that we cannot give 100% of our attention to our dog. Um, there's phone calls. There's the Amazon truck that's showing up to the house. There's the kids that need something. There's somebody that showed up at the door for dropping off a pizza. It's always something. The dog always ends up on the back burner. And we have to recognize that life is what it is and that we really need to try to restrict freedom with our dogs, especially at a young age where they're really impressionable, because this allows us to prevent 90% of the problems that could potentially come up in their life. And if your dog's not going to the bathroom in the house, they're not chewing things up, they're not harassing people at the wrong times of the day, life is really good for you. Like that solves probably 50 to 70% of the issues that you deal with. Right. The other ones are probably when you leave your house, right? Because I know most of our, our clients don't drill their dog on obedience at home the way I would, or the right. way Jeff would. We're dog trainers, right? right. It comes bit. natural. We don't know how to not do that, right? Um, so to that point, um, I think that really looking at how it is that you manage freedom in the house is super important. And one of my favorite tools to keeping dogs safe at home are the indoor units that yep. individual fence uses. I mean, like if you've got a eight week old puppy, these things are awesome. Like, and I'm look, I, Brian's not paying me to be here. Like I, I invited Brian to be here, but I believe in these things because they really make a big difference. Um, what Brian's showing you there is exactly what I'm talking about here. And it is eliminates the gates in your house. It's just a really cool, cool tool. So Brian, why don't you, can you explain how that actually works? Because there's a couple different types. And um, I know that, you know, maybe, maybe not, we won't get too techy, but um, there's, there's kind of two different types and they kind of work for two different types of things. So, so this is the best product we've ever made. Like I, I've been doing invisible fence for 28 years and the way that it works is there's separate correction levels for inside and outside. And what we do is called perfect start plus training where you don't even need to have the dog on a leash. You just kind of set up an avoidance area for it. And it, like if you put it along a cabinet, you and I would be standing 20 feet away and just tell the dog to come. And then we turn the, the unit on and they'll run through it a couple of times, just be on a real low correction. And after about five or 10 minutes, you see them coming at you and then going around the, the signal. And you see them learning where the edge is, how to turn it off. And then a couple of days later, we start bumping the correction up a little bit and then they go, oh, I can't go in the living room. And they go, oh, I can't go there. And we, we even set it up you know, on the other side of the baby gates as we're doing it for really young puppies like that because we're just trying to teach them how to turn it on and turn it off, turn it on and turn it off. And so there's a history on the collar that, that tells me how many times they activated it. And um, it, it's really interesting to see you know, how many times they learn how to turn it on and off, which once you go to turn the correction up a tiny bit, they feel it once or twice and then you just stay away from it. So there's no tripping over the baby gates. There's no peeling the paint off the walls. There's no 
jumping on the couch anymore. Um, you have my, I have a nine month old Australian shepherd puppy and he's not allowed on the couches. He's not allowed to leave my family room or my kitchen. Um, and you know, I just want to minimize, minimize any kind of damage because if he's not in the crate all day and, and you turn around for, for two minutes on him and he can be chewing on something that you don't want him to chew on. And so the less, the less space you give a puppy, the less freedom you give him from the beginning, less is more. The, the less space you give him, the more freedom he's going to have faster because he's going to be in a constricted boundary, be able to learn, you know, you can keep an eye on him. You can, and you, he can learn more faster than if you give him the whole first floor of your house. And then, it, you know, you don't go to your living room sometimes and then you find four piles of poo in there and, and then your, your carpet's ruined. And, and so as it gains its freedom with the indoor units, they're, I always say they're permanently portable. You want it in a permanent space. And then as he gains his freedom, you can always give him back and you know, move him back and give him more more space and go, hey, I don't care if you go upstairs. I just don't want you to go into my living room or dining room. And so you can start you know, expanding his freedom. But this way, instead of having him locked in the crate all the time or running around in your house, it really you know, limits the, the amount of freedom that he has, but still gives him a lot of freedom. So that way, you know, when you call him to come in your kitchen, he's only you know, 20, 30 feet away from you. And he's going to come right back and bouncing over to you. You can have a treat handy and give him a treat. And so it, it teaches him the inside boundary. And then by teaching him a smaller area before you teach him a big area, the, the transference from a smaller area to a bigger area goes a lot faster. And it's like magic. And um, it's kind of cool where as we do the training, there's a history on the collar. And I can tell how many times the dog practiced and tested it. Um, and so that, that just tells me that their whole comfort level during the whole training, the, the whole training process. And right now with, with COVID, we're seeing a, a ton of, of puppies and it's amazing to see how, how tight these dogs are being able to use the whole yard, exactly what somebody wants to give them. And they're super happy and comfortable. So I kind of do the, the, you know, keeping them safe park because that way you can go get groceries at the car. You can get your kids out of the car. You can, you know, um, go get the pizza man at the front door. You don't have to worry about him. You know, at my house, he can't get to the front door. Um, you don't have to worry about him, you know, running down the street if, the, if you're getting groceries out of the car. And this way, it's, it's all part of keeping him safe because if you can keep that, that dog happy, healthy, safe, and well-behaved, he's going to be part of your family for a long time instead of him being a burden to you and ending up at the pound. And that's the last thing you want is to have a nice little dog that, that, you know, just doesn't know any better. And the next thing you know, he's pushing you around. And if you can set up those, those, you know, boundaries and limitations from the beginning, it's going to be, it makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. A saying is uh, just kind of sticking out in my mind right now um, that I heard when I went through dog training school, which is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I think that that's, that's really um, what, what it's about, right, is how do we limit and prevent problems from happening so that the dog doesn't make the wrong mistake and learn the wrong behaviors. And um, so I think that it's um, you know, certainly something that I'm, I, I love. I remember we, I had an indoor unit because we needed to keep the dog that I had at the time away from our cat. Um, and so that worked really well because we just had a, a, a cat side of the house and we had a dog side of the house um, and it worked out really well. And eventually we didn't really need it over there on the cat side of the house. The dog and the cat just learned to kind of cohabitate. They weren't what I would call friends, but they, you know, they cohabitated. Um, and then eventually that dog, this is, I should, I should have said, this is before I started training dogs. Um, yeah. So then he would eat the turkey off the counter on Thanksgiving day. So um, that's where the invisible fence ended up next. Well, it was on the counter um, and it was literally like a thought in action. Let me unplug this, bring it over here and plug it in here. And my dog knew it already. I just had to let him hear it beep once or twice and boom, we were, we were in pretty good shape and, I thought it was awesome. <laughs> that's interesting you say that about the cats because we have three cats at my house and his favorite his favorite dog treat is a, is cat food. And so 
all my cats are set up on one channel. My my dog's set up on another channel, but nobody's allowed upstairs in my house. And so we can have different rules for different pets. And we train the cats the exact same way. Um, you do the perfect start training with them first. They, they learn how to turn it off. And so you can have dogs and cats in the same house living together, but with, with separate rules. And th that makes it really convenient instead of having to worry about, you know, is the cat always going to chase the dog or is, is you know, the, the dog's not going to jump on the counter, but nobody wants a cat on the counter when they're, when they're walking through the cat box. Um, and like my dog's not tall enough to, to get up on the counter, but I don't want the cats on the counter. And now they, they don't even think about jumping up there because yeah, they've just been conditioned to it. Um, so it makes it really easy to have, you know, both dogs and cats and live in harmony. <laughs> I was going to say, your little dog can definitely jump high enough probably to get on a countertop. He's If he watched one of those cats, he could probably figure it out. <laughs> yeah, the, the good thing is he gets pushed around enough by the cats that, that uh, it's not it, it's not bad. They, they don't like him very much. And he's just curious, but they're the old guys here, so they rule. Yeah, the cats, cats are running the show there. All right. So um, one of the, the questions that um, I wanted for us to, you know, talk about around um, the fence here, because, you know, we have people that ask us about the fence sometimes. And, you know, we get all sorts of different questions around, you know, like, how does it work? And, you know, people have asked me, you know, can the dog can't the dog just run through it? Um, and so that was just a, that was like a common question that I heard But Brian, are there, what are, what would you say are one of the mis, most common misconceptions about the fence or, and maybe it's what I'm asking you, maybe it's not, but what, what are your thoughts there? Well, I, I tell everybody, everybody's got the smartest dog, the dumbest dog, the fastest dog, the, you know, the, the high, most high praised dog, the, the ugliest dog, like they, they all have that dog. And I always say they're a dog. And as long as you start slow and kind of work your way up with them, um, you get the same result. And the way that the fence used to work, it was kind of like putting a creek around your house where there was another side to it. So if they ever made a mistake, they ended up on the other side, then they would get trapped on the outside. The way that it works now is, is the collar knows whether it's on the inside or the outside part of the fence. And so if they ever chase something past it, um, it, it's kind of like putting the house in the middle of the ocean. So we can set a timer on the collar. And so if I set it for 10 seconds, that's a long time for them to feel it. But as we're doing the training, we're just teaching them how to turn around and turn around and turn around. And so there's no other side to it. And if they make a mistake, the collar turns off and then they get a free pass coming back in the yard. So as we're doing the training, the history that I was telling you about, I can see the activations, which is how many times somebody practiced and how comfortable the dog is. But I can also tell escapes too. So if Andrew's just letting his dog run all over the neighborhood, I can say, hey, Andrew, 50 activations, great job, 49 escapes. What the heck are you doing? Um, you know, it's, it's not fair for your dog if I go, hey, it's time for me to turn the correction up and you haven't done your homework. So it's, it's, it's a good measure both ways of being able to tell that somebody's practicing with the dog. But it's also, um, you know, when we go to do our seventh day, our graduation day, um, I look for the differences between how many times the collar went off between the first day and the fourth day and then the fourth day and the seventh day. And I had one the other day where the collar had 68 activations on the fourth day, which means the, the, the parents did a lot of homework. Then we bumped it up to, to get into more of a containment level. On the last day, the dog had 168 activations. So a hundred more times the dog was out there pushing the limit and pressing the limit. It's a giant snap shells where I just um, sent them to you guys or her to you guys. Thank and, you. And it, and it was really funny because a hundred more times the dog had been pushing the boundary, but she was still totally comfortable, even though we bumped the collar up. And and it, it was the whole thing of the transference from a smaller area. Then the dog got really comfortable outside. The people did some work. And then as the dog were, was able to go more off leash with just leash dragging on the ground and the people zigzagging in and out of the flags, the dog knew exactly where the boundary was. There were a lot of dogs walking by in the neighborhood. So she tested it a bunch, but she never, she had one escape on the collar. And I go, hey, one escape, that's not bad. And she, she goes, oh, no, that wasn't an escape. My husband took the dog for a walk and stuck the collar in his pocket and walked past it. And that was the only escape. And I was like, hey, that, that's good. And so the, the measurability of, of, of how the system works really helps in getting the result that we want starting from the beginning. And you know, by being able to, to show that to everybody, 
it's kind of neat because they can see the progress that the dogs that the dogs come with. And you know, we used to go, "Oh, is it going to hurt my dog?" And you know, before we, you know, as we do the sales presentation, we make everybody feel it, and then that way they know what they're they're doing. And and I think, you know, the reputation of, of invisible fence has gotten better over the years. Where you know, back when I bought my fence twenty eight years ago, the dog jumped. 10 feet in the air and and we had two and a half acres and he would run up and down the driveway he'd go pee behind a tree and come back and sit on the porch and um i don't think people are as are, are afraid of the the correction anymore um especially since we make them feel it they're they're more interested in learning about the system and they go hey i see my neighbor's dog out there and you know they're it, it's not yeah you know, it's it's not the old way of doing it yeah, you know, it's not your dad's invisible fence, I guess. <laughs> how how many levels is it now? 60, 60 something levels on on the fence to be able to adjust it. There's thirty on the inside and thirty on the outside. So if, if you think of it like a grid, zero is a recognition level. So like when we set it up on the inside, that's where we just kind of want to see them, you know, tilt their head a little bit and then start avoiding it, walking around it. So zero is a recognition level, one is puppy, two is low, three is me. So five, five is high. So there's different correction levels and then different pulse rates. And I was training the German Shepherd puppy today and we started super low and about one, two, he, he kind of started going, I don't think I want to do that. He had really high, high drive to go chase trucks. Well, I got him to, to two, two and at two, two, he, uh, we, there are three Amazon trucks in the neighborhood at the same time. By the time the third one went around, he just would kind of turn his head and go, uh, I don't feel like looking at them anymore. And it was interesting because yeah, you could never tell any difference in the dog because he, you know, he would still perk up. He would still hear it. But when they come by, he would just kind of turn his head and go, all right, I'm done. And and it was by setting the collar on, on two or on one, two really low and having a bunch of real consistent low corrections that once I turned it up just a tiny bit, he was just like, okay, I'm done with that. And so it's, it's low and slow is the, the method that we use. And it, every time he activated the collar, he turned around and got a treat. And by the time the Amazon trucks went by, he just kind of turned around like, all right, where's my treat, man? And so it, it was really, really interesting to watch to, to see this you know, really big prey drive dog on two acres with a bunch of cars going by that he would, he almost yanked my arm out of the socket the first time. Um, and then by the time we were done, he was, you had the leash dragon on the ground. We were going in and out of the flags, running back and forth along his two acres. And had he started that half an hour before, he would probably still be running. He'd probably be in Pennsylvania by now. So I, I have to applaud Brian uh, and his dealership for what they do when it comes to training dogs, because I'll just speak from my experience and um, seeing some other uh, companies. Um, most of them don't provide training the way that you guys do um, of actually going out to the client's home and working with them. Um, it's not just, you know, you, you guys aren't just giving them a DVD and saying good luck or, a, you know, a video and saying good luck, train the dog. Um, you guys are there. You you work with the dog. You, you know, get to know the dog. Um, set, you know, you set the collar based on personality and the, that dog's drives. And I think that level of customization is, is really what's necessary for for people to have a great experience with the fence and you know that's why you guys have um been the number one you know pet containment company in in montgomery county and throughout the world for for you know what that's worth i mean i i don't know of anybody that's done anything like invisible fence so um you know but it really it, it says a lot that you guys put the time that you guys do into the training side of things as a dealership um, cause I know not every single invisible fence dealership even does that. So I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you for that. Thanks. And, and you know, what, what's kind of neat is now that now the technology matches the training. And so we've had dogs that have, have been, you know, on bark collars before not trained right in the system before not been trained right in the e-collar before, and we're able to turn the tone off. And this way we just train them with the flags and the correction. And that way I, I get their actual correction level, right? Because this way I can read them. So, you know, we'll, we'll get a dog that gets adopted from somewhere and a little test I do as we're there the first time with the dog is I always make the collar make a tone. And if the dog, you know, I've had dogs run away and go hide under the bed and go, yeah, we're probably going to turn the tone off on him because if they're associating that tone, how you said with the, the indoor unit when you moved it, you know, that's, that's easy once, once they've already been trained and you, and you reposition the indoor unit. 
But if you get a dog that's sensitive to tone like that, it's kind of neat because you just turn the, the, the tone off on the collar and just do that real low light correction. And you get this beautiful dog that would be a basket case if you left the, the, the tone on. And it, it's just, you know, completely night and day. And, you know, the, the tone that's on the collar, I, I tell everybody it's more there for, for the owner, just to, so you know that it's working. And then when we get to the, the, the training, we, wow, we turn it back on. And so like when you teach them that with the e-collar and you just sit there and you press the button and go sit. And once, the, once they sit down, it goes away. It's the same thing. It's just like training a deaf dog or anything else. It, it's just the behavior you want. You get praised for it. You, you get you do you do what you're supposed to do, and you get praised for it. And it, it's really soft and easy training. And so ha by having that flexibility in the equipment, it's really it's really nice because you can really zero in on exactly what what you want to give the dog. And and we're the ones in control of that, not the not the homeowner. And um, because when you have multiple pets, if you know, I always say if, if my mom was the one trying to, to set up the collar, you know, if she turned the tone off on the dog and he's running down the street, then that that's not good. But also if if she turned it up too high and then my dog didn't go outside again, well, it's not my fault. It, it, you you want to have it. You, you, I want to be in control. So this way, as we're as we're working towards the, the, the goal of, of having them safely contained, we know exactly how many times they've tested it. We know if they've actually ever escaped. We want to know um, exactly what the correction level is on. And so this way we're helping the, the dog owner out the whole time. So that way, by the time we're done, my goal on the last day is I don't want to touch the leash. I just want to be able to go in and out, have the leash dragging around behind them, have the correction level set right. And, and we're just out there socializing and playing with the dog and letting them be a dog, as you were saying. So um, it's kind of neat to see how the, the technology has really, really matched the, the training over the years. Because back when I got my fence, there wasn't a whole lot of... Uh, a whole lot of flexibility system and that that's why I, I do the training that we do now because you know my my outcome and my result wasn't very good 28 years ago and um, just just to see how technology's gotten better it's really helpful for yeah everybody well the, the collars back then were like the size of my water bottle yeah. They, yeah. yeah it was like the saint bernard with like the barrel on its on its neck and now they're smaller than the room yeah, now, now it's like my thumb so uh, yeah, <laughs> my my four cat my four pound uh, fifteen year old cat wears this just because if he doesn't have it on he's you know wandering upstairs or walk, walking over to the neighbor's house and so um, it, it's it's interesting to see even with my cats the history on the collar I've I've wanted to test it five hundred times a month one that tests it ninety nine times a month and another one that that, that tests it four or five times a month that's the fifteen year old um, and then the puppy's like three hundred. And so every single one is is different, but as long as you you know start slow and you work your way up, it doesn't matter if you have the fastest dog, the smartest dog, the dog you know, the, you're going to get the same result. You don't just look at the dog and say, "Oh, he's a husky." You, you don't do that because if you have a plan going into it and say, "Here, let's let's learn how to teach the, the husky to stay away from the couch," he's either on the couch or he's off the couch. He's not going to get hit by a car on the couch, but when you go to take him outside, he's going to hear the tone and back up, and it makes it. Yeah, you know, you're you're kind of um, training them without any kind of consequence, um, any kind of negative consequence, because you know we, I can always go off with it. It's not harder to come back. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I mean, everybody should you know definitely keep this in mind as um, a tool that you should consider. Like we suggest a lot of different tools to people, um, you know, and sometimes we're recommending a treat. Sometimes we're recommending a leash or a collar or um, you know whatever the case may be. Invisible fence is just another tool, and you know if you're looking for a tool that like ultimately just helps you to keep your dog safer at home and gives them and and give them more freedom at home, you should have it. It just makes sense. Um, if you're not concerned about that, like you don't have any safety concerns with your dog, your dog's you know perfect in that sense, then yeah, maybe you don't feel that strong desire for it. Um, the way that somebody who's got a dog that's running the night would, but I would tell you that even if you have a dog that's really well behaved, um, it does really allow you to have some nice additional freedom for the dog, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Um, one of the things that I, I just think is cool um, is, you know, when I first started watching dogs get trained on the fence, we didn't use any, any treats or anything like that back then. Um, we just used a leash collar and praise. 
Um, and so it's really cool to see um, see treats being used in, in fence training now. And it makes a lot of sense because treats are an amazing training tool and, and so are toys, right? Toys are just another wonderful training tool. Jess, let me ask you, you know, when, when you have a dog that you're training, how do you decide if you're going to use a treat or toy with them? Um, it, it depends on, I guess, how drivey the dog seems. You know, a lot of times when um, students are coming in either for lessons or for classes or and consultations for that matter, um, the dogs have already sometimes had breakfast. And so, you know, their kibble's not going to be enough or we have to figure out what type of motivator they have. So um, I know for, for two out of our three dogs here are super, super food motivated. Um, my little French bulldog tater tot, he is not really food motivated, not even toy motivated. And he could kind of care less if you give him an ear scratch. So he's he's kind of a little stoic in that in that regard. But it it depends on I guess what the owner also at the end of the day, some families want to wean off of treats a little bit quicker. Um, so then they might want to just use praise or play orientation. So first we have to look at the dog, see um, what their what their drive is. Um, most dogs, I would say about 90, 95% are gonna be food motivated. Mm -hmm. um, I had There's a couple of dogs that would rather play with a flirt pole or with a tug toy or, or a ball. Yeah, for me, I, I think about um, what it is that I want to teach the dog. Um, number one, I need to know what is the dog's primary motivation in life? Is it is it food? Is it prey or toys? Or is it maybe my praise? And usually we have a pretty good uh, indicator of that when we're training our dogs. Um, but it, lo it really depends to me on what it is that I'm training the dog to do. So I tend to think of um, training a dog for obedience as teaching the dog to tend to be calmer. Um, and when I think about using a toy, a toy doesn't help to build calm and stillness into the dog. Yet. It puts them on edge. It puts them to, to drive. Um, and so I tend to not use um, toys when I'm initially teaching a dog. I really like to use food because it forces the dog to slow down. Um, it's an instinctual reward to the dog. Um, and it allows me to teach with a little bit more precision because I don't have a dog that's quite as energized. Um, so I can, I can lay the foundation for calmer obedience. Down the road, um, using a toy becomes a better option if I want to start getting my dog to do things faster. So if I want my dog to be able to switch obedience because it's from a sit to a down to a stand or um, maybe there's something else that I'm doing, I think toys are good when we really want to drive speed into the dog. So teaching our, our recalls, um, I love using toys. When I all come, they come to me, and as soon as they get to me, boom, they get released to a toy. And that builds a lot of great speed um, into my dog. But even better than either one is um, our product of the month. Uh, so we are throwing a product of the month feature in here for you all today because some of you already know we have retail market coming very, very soon. Uh, we are really excited to have that open up and uh, it's in process. We are uh, getting some plans finalized and uh, hopefully we'll get that, that place opened as soon as possible for you. But um, Ultimately, we were thinking about, we want to make sure that we are letting you all know what we think are the very best things for your dog. We, we are not serving you and we're not helping you as a dog owner by not putting things in front of you that are ultimately going to make life better for you and your dog. Um, I'm not getting paid for any of this. Uh, we just are wanting to make sure that we serve our clients and that you don't miss out on things that could, could make your life easier. So our our feature product is the Kong Wobbler. And the Kong Wobbler, I'll have Matt in a minute. You're going to throw up a little quick demonstration of it. But it's a cool toy. A lot of you know about the Kongs because every single person has a Kong. Um, but the Kong Wobbler is a really cool and unique tool that you can put your dog's meals inside of. And it's a great way to teach your dog to play on their own and be a little bit more independent. Um, helps to stimulate their mind and fire them out. So if you've got a young dog or even if you've got an older dog, 
And actually, I should even say, maybe it's better with an older dog because it's a great way to get them up and get them active, um, where they may normally just eat and then go and lay back down. This is going to prolong that process a little bit. So Matt, can you throw up that, um, that little demo of the uh, Kong Wobbler for us? So you can definitely see the wheels turning on those dogs while they're sitting there pawing that thing around, trying to get it, you know, get the treat out of it. And there's a whole bunch of different types of interactive food toys on the market, but um, that's one that we definitely recommend. You know, it's a really, really high quality product. So definitely something for you to consider in your next shopping spree for your dog. Anyways, um, I just wanted to make sure that we, uh, uh, you can throw that one back on that. That's uh, junior. Can, let's give Matt a big props here for this picture here. I mean, that is just awesome. And this is not Photoshop. This is the real deal. And for those of you that don't know, Matt is in the background and he's uh, helping us to run uh, Ask the Experts live here. And uh, Matt has done a great job with uh, pictures and graphics and um, actually um, if you haven't seen already, we were um, in the We Love Our Wobbler. Yes, Danny, they are great, aren't they? They are awesome. Um, but we were actually just listed in the Pet Boarding and Daycare magazine as their profile of success for their January, February issue. And a lot of Matt's photographs um, were in there. So uh, thank you, Matt, for, uh, for doing all the, the heavy lifting in the background. But I think we're up on time here. I had a great time with you guys tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for jumping on here. You guys have anything fun planned for the rest of the night? Just hanging out with the dogs, right? Just just hanging out with the dogs, hanging out with Bradley. There you go. I have to eat dinner. I haven't eaten anything all day. Oh, no. <laughs> Brian has been working all day, and he's like, I'm ready to eat. All right, without further ado, you all have a better than great night. Um, if you know somebody who you think could benefit from today's video, we'd love it if you shared this with them. Uh, thank you all again for jumping on, and we'll look forward to seeing you all very soon for our next episode of Ask the Doggy Experts Live. Have a better than great night. Okay.